yeah, dude, we got you. There's two things that you need to know. They're like, the first is, so when you get up on the line, you've got to keep your arms out for balance, because otherwise you're, you're not going to be able to balance on the line. And they said the second one was you, you need to look where you're going. They had it up between two trees. They were like, you've got to keep your eyes straight on that tree in front of you, because if you don't, there's no way you're going to be able to balance. It's like, okay, easy enough. That, that sounds good. So I try to, try to step up on the line, and I get one foot up, and I go to try to get the other foot up, and I, I can't even do that. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a long day. Uh, so I, I have somebody stand there, and I put my hand on their shoulder, and I finally get up on the line. I'm like, okay, I, I think I can do this. And I get my hands up, and I take about two steps, and then I see out of the corner of my eye like a car drive by, and I have the attention span of, think like golden retriever puppy, um, not even full grown golden retriever, but puppy, like I have zero attention span. And so I see this car go by, I'm like, ooh, what, what was that? And immediately fall off the line. So I'm like, oh, okay, I got this. I, I got two steps in, I can, I can get the rest the next 20 feet. And so I'm like, okay, give me one more chance. So I get back up, uh, I get up a little bit better this time, I take three or four steps. And then one of my small group guys shows up, hey, Tony, and I'm like, oh, oh, hey, and gone. I'm just off the line again. I'm like, shoot, okay, let me try one more time. And at this point, there's like four or five people lined up. They're like, hey, like, they're getting ready. They're getting angsty because they're like, this is, who's this washed up 20-year-old kid who's trying to slack line? He should go pick up like, I don't know, some old man sport. And I'm like, no, just give me, give me one more try. And so I, I get on the line, and this time I'm like, okay, I got this. I'm going to put my hands up. I'm going to look straight at that tree. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start walking. And so I get one, two, I get like three strides in. And then, uh, I don't know slacklining terminology, but I, something started to happen that I have deemed the wobble of death. It's where the line, like when you start to lose your balance a little bit, and the line starts doing this, and then pretty soon it's doing that, and you're just, at that point, you got no chance. And I didn't know that, so I, I'm, I'm walking along this line and I see it start to do that and any normal person would just like hop off and say, okay, I'm gonna take the L, I'm gonna move on. And I was like, no, I'm gonna make it to the end. And the best way to do that is to start sprinting. And so I'm like four steps in and I just start booking it as fast as I can at this, this other tree and I make it, I don't know, maybe five more feet and then slip and so I fall onto the line and then fall onto the ground after that in front of everybody. It was like, it's Wednesday night, so we've got Awana and we've got middle school. We've got all sorts of stuff going on out at Calvary and they were probably looking over and it's like, yep, that's one of your high school leaders. <laughs> he's, he, yep, he's real responsible. But <laughs> the reason I tell that story is not because it was a shining moment for me because it obviously wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't even just to tell a funny story. It was because I think a lot of us are like that in our faith. As funny as it sounds, when, when I was told, okay, there's two things that you gotta do. You gotta get your arms out, and then you gotta look at that tree in front of you. You gotta focus on one thing, and that's the only way you're gonna get across this line. That a lot of us in our faith get distracted so easily from Jesus. When Jesus calls us, he says, he says hey, just keep your focus on me. But we let things in our lives, we let things in that, that make us too busy to focus on Jesus or there's a sin that we're struggling with, there's something that we're struggling with that, that you know starts to take our focus off of Jesus and we all of a sudden, we look up and, and we're like, well, well, what happened? And so the good news that I wanna share with you today is this is not just an issue that, that we deal with. This isn't like a, a Calvary Westlake issue. This isn't a 21st century issue. This is something that the very people that walked with Jesus when he was doing ministry 2,000 years ago, this is something that they struggled with. And so if you guys have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 14. That's where we're going to be. And just to set the stage a little bit, what, what was going on is Jesus and the disciples were, were traveling around from town to town. Uh, Jesus was speaking. He was doing miracles. He was healing people. He was doing all these incredible things. And he, he just got done with a, a day where he'd been doing that. And he just fed uh, the 5,000. If you guys know that story, he just taken uh, seven loaves and, and 12 fishes. He'd multiplied that food to feed 5,000 people. He'd done a pretty, a pretty good day's work, like if you, if you think about it that way. And now it was, it was getting to be nighttime. And he tells the disciples this, is, this is how it starts. He said, immediately after this, immediately after feeding those people, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. Well, he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. And so he, what he had done is he, he told the disciples, okay, we're over here, and then there's this lake, and this is where we're getting to, is the other side of the lake. He said, okay, you guys take the boat. You guys go over to the other side of the lake. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to send these people home, uh, and then I'll catch up with you later. And the first thing that crossed my mind, I was like, well, 
didn't one of the disciples at least care enough to ask Jesus how he was going to get there? Like, they were taking the boat to go across this big lake. They're like, what's Jesus going to do? Is he going to swim? Or like, we're just leaving him out to dry over here. It's like, okay, bye, Jesus. We'll see you in a few days or however long it takes. But, but that's, what, that's what Jesus did. He, he sent the people home. He sent the disciples out on the boat. And then he went, went to pray by himself. And then it says, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land. For a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting the waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. So, so what had happened is the, the waves had started to get bigger, and the storm had started to come in. And the disciples, like, they, they weren't in this big yacht. This wasn't like a, a cruise ship that they were taking across this lake. Think like a little tiny rowboat. And there's 12 of them in this boat. So there were probably one tired, two upset that there's 12 of them in this tiny little boat, and three a little bit nervous because those were the kind of boats that would capsize. Like that, that, was a real, that was a reality for them is that they might drown out there. And the first point that I want to make is that maybe that's, that's what, what you're feeling right now is you're like, okay, maybe Jesus has sent me somewhere and, and I don't even know where he is. Like Jesus just sent the disciples out in this boat and maybe they were thinking, well, okay, cool. Jesus just sent us into the storm and he's not here. Like, does he really care about us? And what I want to say to that is that Jesus sent them out. He knew that the storm was coming. He knew that it wasn't going to be this easy sailing for the disciples, and he sent them out anyways. Why? Because he's in control. He knew that they, that they were going to get through that storm. He knew that he was going to show up and do something incredible in that storm. And so he decided to send the disciples into it. It goes on like this. It says, about 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I am here. And for us, while we're reading this, we can see, we know how the story ends. And so we can see this and we're like, oh, that's so comforting. Jesus says he's there and he, the disciples saw him and it was all just, it was all better at that point. But imagine being in the disciples' shoes. They're on zero sleep. They've seen some crazy things with Jesus. So they see somebody walking on the water towards them that looks like Jesus, but they're like, that might not be Jesus. Like, this is 3 a.m. Maybe we're, maybe we're hallucinating. Maybe, like, there was something in that, the loaves and the fishes. Like, I don't know, dude. This is weird. We're seeing things. And, and Jesus is saying it's him, but is it really him? And so they're kind of testing Jesus. Look at, look at what Peter says here, one of the disciples. He says, then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you. He's kind of testing. He's like, okay, Jesus, if this is really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. He's saying, okay, Jesus, if this is you, like, then I'm going to come out and get to where you are. But if it's not, like, you know, you can't, I can't walk on the water. That's not something I can do on my own. And so if this isn't you, I'm going to step out of this boat and just look like a fool because I'm going to fall into the water, and then we're going to know that it's not you. And so then and Jesus responds with, yes, come. And now Peter's got that choice. He can either stay in the boat or he can step out and start walking toward Jesus. And he says, okay, you know, I see Jesus. I see where he is at. And he's calling me to step out of this boat and walk on the water. And so I'm going to make that decision to trust that, one, it is him, and two, that he's going to take care of me. If he says I can walk on the water, I can walk on the water. And so Peter takes that first step, and he starts, starts out on that journey. And I think that's, that's where a lot of us, maybe you've had that mountaintop faith experience where you have been in the same position that Peter was in, where you see Jesus so clearly or you feel God's presence if you're in this room and you call yourself a Christian, you've had some sort of experience where you had that aha moment, where you said, okay, God, I know you're real, I know you're there, and I'm choosing to follow you, because that's what a Christian is, is somebody who decides to follow Jesus. And so Peter, Peter steps out of that boat, he's like, okay, you know, I've made that decision. And then he starts walking in the water, and look at what happens to him. He says, so Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And I think that's where a lot of us as Christians get to, too. I think that we have that, that great moment of faith where we say, Jesus, I see you. I'm fixing my focus on you. It's you and me. Like, I'm, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And then life gets hard. Maybe you lose some friends because you became a Christian. Maybe they start gossiping about you. Maybe there's something in your life that you were struggling with before you became a Christian, and then you, you thought that that was just going to go away. When you called upon Jesus, that thing that you said you'd never do again, and that, that just keeps coming back. All of a sudden, your circumstances in your life 
start to overwhelm you. You start looking around, you take your eyes off of Jesus, just like Peter did. It said he, he was looking at Jesus, and he was walking toward him, but then he took, he started to see what was around him. He started to see the wind, he started to see the waves, and he started to sink. And maybe that's you in this room. Maybe there's somebody here who you've been so focused on your circumstances. You had your eyes on Jesus, but then you started looking around, and you're like, wow, life is hard. Life as a Christian is hard. Maybe you're doubting, maybe you're thinking, maybe this whole Christian thing isn't even worth it because you feel just like Peter was where he's, he's floundering around in the water and he's like, I don't know what to do. Like I am completely out of control. Jesus called me to walk on this water. I'm not walking, I'm drowning. And I think that there's two types of people here that, that could be in this situation that, that Peter's in. The first is, is exactly what he's, he's doing where he has this mountaintop moment of faith, Jesus I'll follow you and then, then his circumstances come in and he starts to drown. And then if you look at his response, he cries out, Lord, save me. And I think that there's some of you in this room that have done that over and over and over. And you're wondering, Jesus, why haven't you delivered me from that sin? Why haven't you delivered me from that addiction? Because I keep crying out to you saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did last Friday. I'm sorry for, for doing that thing that I said I was never gonna do again. Please forgive me. And then a week later, you go and do the same thing. And you're like, Jesus, I'm sorry. And you genuinely mean it, but it's something that you're struggling with and you feel like you have asked for forgiveness too many times that you are now too far gone and Jesus is just gonna let you drown. And that's the first group that I wanna speak to tonight, that if that's you and you're on the verge of giving up and saying, Jesus, just let me drown because I'm not worthy, because I'm not worthy of you coming and rescuing me or maybe because I don't think you're even there, I don't think you can. Maybe if that's what you're thinking. What I wanna say to you is that if you call on the name of the Lord, he will save you, because look what Jesus does. Peter cries out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Immediately. Because Jesus sees you exactly where you are. He sees you in the middle of your drowning. He's not, he didn't look at Peter and he was like, he didn't say, okay, dude, well, why, why did you have so little faith? I'm just gonna let you drown now. He wasn't like, oh, you gotta believe in me more and then I'm gonna reach down. No, he meets Peter exactly where he's at, in the middle of his drowning, in the middle of his shortcoming, because he had straight up said earlier, he's like, Jesus, I'm gonna walk out to you if that's you. He had said that and then he broke that promise and he's drowning and so Jesus had every right to be like, dude, what are you doing? But no, Peter cried out, he said, Lord, save me and Jesus reached down and picked him up. And so that's the first group of you that you feel like you just keep struggling and keep struggling. And my encouragement to you is keep calling out to Jesus because he will show up. You know, there, there's things that we all struggle with. There's things that we all, we live in a sinful world and we all struggle with things, but when we call on the name of the Lord and ask for forgiveness, he's gonna meet us exactly where we're at. But the issue is I think that there's a second group in this room who you've, started to, to drown or started to flounder in, in the water and you have started to think that's okay. That you, you don't think that you need to call out to Jesus. You don't think that you need to say, hey Lord, save me. You've just decided that it's okay to be where you're at. That maybe you're, you're coming to church on Sunday, coming to small group on Wednesdays, you're coming to all the events, you look right, you, you bring your Bible everywhere, but you don't really love Jesus, you don't recognize your need for him. That there's those things, those, that secret sin that the, the first group was struggling with, but they're like, Jesus, please deliver me. Like, I don't want to live in this. You're using scripture to justify why that's okay for you, why you're the exception. And what that is, is that's hypocrisy. That if you, if you come in and, it, and you're saying, you know, Jesus, this is where you're calling me. Like, I can see you. I remember that time at camp, or I remember that time on Sunday service when I, I felt your presence, and I was like, I'm gonna make a change but then you started walking, you went back to real life, and you're like, ah, you know, that, that might not be worth it. You know, maybe I'll lose popularity, maybe I'll lose friends, maybe I'll lose social status, maybe I'll lose something, I have to give something up to follow Jesus. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep living the way I'm living because so far it's worked out. I built my identity up on something, whether it's sports or school or, or theater or music or just anything other than Jesus and you've started to build, build your life up around that and, and make things, you know, to kind of try to fit in your little bubble. And what I would say is that's idolatry and that's hypocrisy. And what you need to do 
is you need to look up and cry out, Jesus, I need you. Like, Lord, save me. Because in the end, that's where you're at. You might be so focused on your circumstances. Like, you know, you might be, be floundering around, swimming around. You think that you're, you're in control, but it's because you can't even see Jesus. Because you are so focused on your circumstances. So focused on your life, on yourself, on the things that you think will make you happy that you don't even want to look to Jesus. Because you're worried about how things might change if you do. So that's, that's the second group. But look at how, how Jesus responds here. He reaches down, he pulls Peter up. He immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And I want to take a second to look at the order of how things happen because I had just said that Peter immediately reached down and picked Peter up, or Jesus picked Peter up. And he saved him from what, what he was struggling with. And then, then, he calls him out and says, like, don't you understand? You've been literally walking with me, seeing me do miracles, seeing me do all of these incredible things. Why do you still doubt me? If I say you can walk on the water, who are you to say, no, I can't? Who are you to limit me? Who are you to, to all of a sudden take your eyes off of me and, and then expect things to just, just be the same? He says, why did you doubt me? Don't you know I'm in control? And I think that that's something somebody in here needs to hear is that you do feel like you've been drowning. You feel like you're in the middle of that storm. You're in the middle of those waves and you, maybe you can't even see Jesus. And, and so you need to call out to him. You need to say, hey, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I need you to rescue me from, from what I'm going through. I need you to come into the midst of all of my, my issues, in the midst of all my brokenness, in the midst of everything and save me. And then I'm gonna turn to you and say, look, I know you're in control. I've been trying to control my situation, but now, Jesus, you're in control because that's, that's what we try to do. When, when our circumstances start to go bad and we take our eyes off Jesus, we put our eyes on ourselves, and we start to try to control things. I don't know if this has happened to anybody else, but for me, when things start to go poorly, my first inclination is not to say, hey, Jesus, have your way. My first inclination is to say, okay, how can I manipulate this situation to make it okay? Because we don't like uncertainty. We don't like not knowing, and so I'd, I'd rather have an illusion of control than, than trust in a God that I can't see and give up control to him, and that's just, that's our sinful nature talking. Like that's, if we're really honest with ourselves, I think that's a lot of you in here are the same way as me, that you wanna control things, when really what you need to do is, is realize, you look around, you're like, okay, my circumstances suck. You know, what I'm going through, it sucks right now, because that's, if I'm being blatantly honest, that's what life is sometimes. Life does suck sometimes. But if we can take our eyes off of our circumstances and say, you know what, Jesus, no matter what happens, I'm going to fix my eyes on you. Whether you fix my circumstances or not, I'm going to fix my eyes on you because I know that you're going to reach down, you're going to grab me exactly where I'm at and that you're going to get me through it. That the... Uh, Verse 32 says, when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. You see, it, it took something, something so incredible for Jesus not only to walk on the water, for Jesus not only to save Peter after he tried to walk on the water, to get him back into the boat, for everything to be okay, then they said, okay, Jesus, we're gonna trust in you. Like, that's what it's gonna take to, for us to say that you are the son of God. And he's like, look, didn't, don't you get it? You have, you have so little faith. Like, you know, can't you just trust that I'm in control? And so I wanna, I wanna and I've got a story, just sharing a little bit of my story, because I don't, I don't think I've shared a lot of it with, with you guys. I grew up in Colorado uh, in a small little town, and I met the Lord in high school after my freshman year. And growing up before that, uh, sports were huge. For me, sports were huge in our town because it wasn't like here. We didn't have recruits to top colleges coming out of, of every class. We didn't have college athletes coming out, all-star athletes that, that came out of our valley all the time. And so from a very, very young age, uh, lacrosse was my main sport. And from a very young age, I, I was playing and I loved it. And it was, I thought that that's what I was going to be doing for, for the rest of my life. And, and I had coaches and I, would, I did the whole club thing. And uh, it, was, it was getting recruited, and I was like, okay, you know, this is, this is where I'm going. I'm going to play D1 college lacrosse. All of a sudden, the expectations came 
that, okay, this kid could be the one in the Valley that does break through into, into college sports, that this kid could be the one. And I started to, to listen to all of that. I started to listen to the things that people would say. I started to, to listen to my own doubts, but my own, my own dreams. And I was like, you know, okay, this is, this is where I'm going. And it was all about me. Then Jesus came in after my freshman year and he started to slowly teach me that it's not about me. That he started to, to break into everything that I had previously thought and I was fighting him on it, I really was. Because I was like, no Jesus, this is where I'm going. I'm gonna go play college sports. I'm gonna go, like this is what I'm doing and if you fit into that puzzle, like if you fit in, then it's gonna work out. But I wanna try to control my situation and then if you fit into it, you can be a part of it, but, but I don't want to change where I'm at. But what I didn't realize is that I was, I was in the middle of, of the waves that I was drowning, and I needed to shift my focus to Jesus. And as he started to shift my focus, I started to, to physically struggle with some things. After my sophomore year, I, uh, my hip started to hurt, my right hip. And at first I thought I was just being a wimp, and so I tried to play through it. I tried to keep running. I tried to keep playing. I tried to, tried to do everything I could to stay healthy, and it kept getting worse. That pretty soon, within the next five months, I couldn't run anymore. I was walking to class. I was, you know, I was taking a couple of Advil every day just so that I could walk around with my backpack on my back. And during that time, I wrestled with Jesus. I would love to stand here before you and say, you know, I... I did fix my focus on Jesus the whole time, even though my circumstances were going downhill, that I did fix my focus on Jesus through, through that whole time, but that's not, not how the story went, and I would be a hypocrite if I told you that that's how I was. But Jesus started to work something into me. As that was going on, he was like, look, one, this is not about you. This is not about you, this is not about your glory, because you know, there's gonna be another kid that comes in four or five years later, that they're gonna be the next big thing. You know, there's going to be another, another kid at your, your school, as smart as you, you guys all are, that, that there's going to be a valedictorian next year. There's going to be a valedictorian the year after. That there's going to be more D1 recruits. And if your identity is on that, that's a foundation that's built on sand. And that's where my foundation was. And it was starting to crumble. And Jesus was saying, he just really spoke this one thing to me. And Ben read this scripture at the very beginning. It's Psalm 16, 8. It says, I will fix my eyes on the Lord always. For with him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And so as I was going through this, this junior year that was just, circumstantially was getting worse and worse, as my identity was crumbling, Jesus was saying, look, I'm doing this so that you'll look at me. So that you'll stop thinking it's all about you and you'll start working for my glory. And that was something that was life-changing for me because all of a sudden I started I started volunteering at church. I started showing up to youth group. I started doing these things that would help serve others and, and that, uh, that would really help serve God. Not because God needed me, but because I finally realized that I needed Jesus. That I'd been, I'd been floundering around so long that I, I had my own identity, I had my own thing going, but I realized that that's not, that was not what it was about and that I needed Jesus to step in. And so I cried, I was like, Lord, save me. And, and I prayed over and over and over, Lord, would you heal my hip? Would you do a miracle? Would you do something that would let me keep playing? Because now I understand. Now I've got this, this shifted perspective. Now would you please take this away from me? And uh, there's some pictures that, that we're gonna put up that he, he didn't. That at the beginning of my senior year, I had a, a hip surgery that, that would take me out of lacrosse. The, those, those dreams that I had they were, they were gone, that's, that's the surgery picture, and then we've got a, a, another one. Those are shorts, not boxers, I promise. Um, <laughs> you can tell that I had just great fashion sense, um, obviously, but that was, that was the reality of my senior years. My circumstances didn't change, but my perspective did. And that's something for each one of you that if, it would be amiss if you left this room thinking that, that what I was saying to you is that if you just cry out to God, everything's gonna be sunshine and rainbows, because that's not the way it is. That you know, sometimes, yes, Jesus does deliver you from your circumstances. Sometimes that thing that you've been struggling with forever, sometimes Jesus does heal in a minute, but sometimes you're gonna keep struggling. Sometimes Jesus doesn't, say, doesn't fix your circumstances, 
but it's because he wants you to fix your focus on him. He wants you to say, you know, no matter what happens in my life, you're still good. No matter what happens to me, I'm not gonna focus on, on what, what it is that's happening to me, I'm gonna focus on my God and on who he is. And that Jesus, you know, no matter what season of life I'm in, no matter what, whether I feel like I'm walking on the water towards you, or I feel like I've been, been floundering and I'm about to drown and I've been there for years, I'm gonna fix my focus on you because in the end, you're gonna be victorious. I'm gonna go ahead and, and invite the band up uh, just as I close. But for you guys, I just wanna, wanna leave you with this challenge. I'm just asking the question of where's your focus? Because the things in your life are not bad. Those things, school is not a bad thing. Sports are not a bad thing. Those things that you, you know, popularity even isn't a bad thing. God can use that. But when those things become idols in your life, when your, your circumstances or your decisions or your lifestyle, you start to say, this is who I am, and you focus on those things instead of focusing on Jesus, that's, that's when you need to readjust. That's when you need to take your focus and say, Jesus, no matter what, I'm gonna look to you. So maybe, maybe you're, you're out here and you, you feel like you're, you've been doing really well. Keep going. You feel like you've been walking on the water, keep going. Keep chasing Jesus because he's gonna do incredible things. Maybe you're here and, and you're feeling like you've been calling out to Jesus and he's not answering. Keep calling out, keep focusing on Jesus because Romans 8, 28 says that God works all things for the good of those who love him. You may not see it. It might not look the same way that you think it's gonna look. But Jesus is working all things out for your good and his glory. And all you gotta do is keep chasing Jesus. Give up control. Tell him that, that he's got it. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna pray for us and then uh, just sit tight in your seats because I'm gonna, gonna introduce, we got something special tonight.